So what comes to mind when you hear the word evangelist or evangelism? If you're like most people, you think of the preacher. I mean, you wouldn't be far off. That's, that's not a bad answer. It may be images of people like Billy Graham or somebody we would consider to be like a TV preacher. We call them televangelists. People like that is, is who we typically think about when we hear those words, evangelism, evangelism, evangelist. We don't normally think about ourselves, but we should. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you should consider yourself an evangelist with a responsibility and a duty to participate in evangelism. In fact, you probably already do it and you just don't realize it. You see, the word evangelist and evangelism come from a Greek word that simply means to bring or to tell good news. That's what evangelism is. So an evangelist is simply a person who brings or tells other people good news. And so maybe you've had a conversation here recently and you walked up to a friend or a family member or your spouse and you said, hey, I got some good news for you. Or you were telling them a story about something maybe that wasn't so good. And then you said, but wait, here's the good news. If you've ever said anything like that, in that moment, you were being an evangelist. You were telling them good news. Now, when we go to the Bible, evangelism, it takes on a whole new meaning. Now, the definition of the word doesn't change, but obviously the good news that we're telling changes. When the Bible talks about sharing good news or evangelizing, what it's talking about is sharing the good news message about Jesus. The message that God has provided man a way of salvation through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the good news that we've been given, the responsibility to go and tell or share with other people. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said, go into all the world and preach. Now, you might not consider yourself a preacher, but it just simply means to tell or to proclaim, declare good news. Preach the gospel to all creation. Now, the interesting thing here is that the word that Jesus used that we translate into gospel in the English has the same root word as the word evangelism, as the word evangelist. Go into all the world and tell people the good news. And I think that's where many Christians today have fallen off the wagon. We've allowed ourselves to believe that this responsibility to tell the good news to the world is somebody else's job. It's the pastor's job. It's the televangelist's job. It's the person who's never met a stranger, who has some form of evangelism method memorized, who, who, doesn't, who doesn't find it fearful to talk to other people they don't know, who has Scripture memorized and is not afraid to use it. It's their job to tell other people about Jesus. But if that's our thoughts about evangelism, we're, we're completely wrong. Now understand that people who would meet those particular descriptions, well, they certainly have a responsibility if they know Christ, if He's done anything in their life, if He has saved them and forgiven them of their sin, sure, they have a responsibility. But it's not theirs alone. We share in that same responsibility. Something else I think that we've been led to believe about evangelism that just simply isn't true, but it's certainly been quite effective in making us ineffective evangelists. And that is this idea that evangelism and telling other people about Jesus, it, that it's some spiritual gift. You have to have certain qualifications or some sort of gifting to be able to do it. Now, I certainly believe that every follower of Christ who has the indwelling Spirit of God in their life has been given what is called a spiritual gift. Now, let me make this very simple. A spiritual gift is simply an ability or skill to do something well that has been imparted to you 
by the Spirit of God. Now, you may not know what that is. You may think, I have no idea what my spiritual gift might be. I would challenge you to discover it. Look for it. Study. Go to the Bible where you find lists of, of spiritual gifts. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks a lot about spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12. 1 Peter chapter 4. They all have lists of what these gifts could be. But you know one that you won't find on those lists? Evangelism. It's not there. It doesn't mean that there aren't certain people who are good at it. Or might even be better at it than others. Better than you. Better than me. But it's not a spiritual gift. Now somebody might uh, want to debate me about that and say, well, what about... You know, over there in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, evangelism is on that list. Let me read that for you. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, uh, the, the, the church at Ephesus, and he said in chapter 4, verse 11, that Christ himself gave, he, in other words, he, he gave to the church, the body, apostles, prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. He said, well, there it is. You know, it's on the list. Paul wasn't talking here. In Ephesians 4 about spiritual gifts, he was talking about offices and ministries in the church. These were were seen as uh, leadership positions. And then somebody says, well, there you go. It's a leadership position. It's not for me. Let me clarify. One, why did Christ give these particular types of offices or ministries in the church? Well, he tells us why in verse 12 where Paul says to equip his people. For works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In the context of what Paul is saying here, elsewhere in the New Testament, and what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 and other places about evangelism, here's what I think we can conclude about evangelism. One, it is not a spiritual gift, it's not on the list. But two, for some, it is a calling. Just like the calling of pastor, teacher, here among the list were apostles and prophets. Those were callings. Those were uh, specific, you know, life callings. That, that These people would dedicate themselves fully to these activities. Again, think about Billy Graham and think about others who committed their entire lives, they dedicated their entire lives to going around and and telling other people about Jesus, the, the office of evangelism. So for some people, evangelism is going to be a calling. But I think the New Testament teaches us that for all people, all followers of Christ, it's a command. We all have a responsibility. And so you might be thinking, well, why are we talking about this particular? Well, one, I mean, we're in church. That's what we talk about. You know, telling other people about Jesus. What did you expect, you know? But it, it goes in line with what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. You know, this particular series correlates with everything that we've been teaching this past week to the kids that came out for Kids Jam. And so we've been going back over these passages, and, and, and I've been introducing you to them as parents and grandparents so that you, you probably witnessed this this week. You experienced it. Your kids come home from Kids Jam. They're excited to tell you about the story they learned that night and, and what they got from it. And I don't want you to just be oblivious and not know what they're talking about. But I want to give you the opportunity to talk with your kids and your grandkids and your nieces and nephews about the Bible and, and to understand it yourselves. And so we've been talking about everything that they've been learning this past week. And it was an incredible week. Over 200 kids. 100 plus volunteers, thank you guys for doing that. That was incredible. We cannot do it without you. And I know it's an exhausting week. It really is. You can see it on all the faces of the volunteers by about Wednesday. It's totally drained. But here's the good news. Let me be an evangelist for a second. Um, It won't happen again until next July. (laughs) So you got all year to recuperate. And then we'll do it all over again next July. And we will need you then just as desperately as we needed you this week, so we thank you for, for serving. But this week, uh, we, really, we really made a point to teach the kids of our church and their friends 
the importance, the subtitle or theme of the week was to shine Jesus' light. To go out there and be an evangelist. To tell others about Jesus. To talk about the good news of the gospel and the difference that he makes in your life and the difference he can make in their lives. So we've got a bunch of little evangelists in our church, and that's, that's exciting. You know, if you go out and you tell kids, hey, go out there and tell your friends and your family members and just strangers at Walmart about Jesus, they'll do it. And they'll be excited about it. Listen, we, parents, we need to follow their example. Matter of fact, we need to lead the way. We need to show them that this is important. This is what followers of Christ do. And so uh, one of the stories that we didn't get to this week because we brought in the science guy on Thursday night um, deals particularly with sharing Christ with others. It comes from Acts chapter 8, and we're going to go there here in just a minute. It's the story of a disciple named Philip who found himself on a desert road talking to an Ethiopian government official about Jesus and led him to Christ. We're going to talk about that story here in just a minute, but... The point I want to make before we get there is, again, we have challenged the kids this week to go out and do this. Now it's your turn. It's my turn. Our turn as parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles. And what a shame it would be if our kids, who are so excited about what Jesus has done for them, and so eager to tell other people, what a shame it would be if they came to us and said, Hey, Mom. Dad, when was the last time you told somebody about Jesus and we didn't have an answer? We cannot let that happen. We cannot let the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of I don't know enough about the Bible to stop us from becoming courageous, contagious Christians. we got to step up. Now, there's a book out there I'd recommend to you. Its author is named uh, Mark Middleberg. And the book is called Becoming a Contagious Christian. And in the book, he talks about different approaches and styles to personal evangelism. He affirms the fact that we all share in this responsibility, but we're all different. We don't all share the same type of personality. Some are introverts, some are extroverts. You know, some of us have more knowledge about the Scripture than, than others. We have, we have different characteristics of our personality. So how we approach this responsibility to tell others about Christ is going to differ from person to person. And he outlines that there are about six or so different styles, if you will, that match certain types of personalities. And, and typically, the type of personality you, that you have will determine the style or your approach to telling others about Jesus. Let me give you some of those real quick and, and a couple examples in the Bible of, of these types of people. And you might be able to quickly identify with one or more of them. And there are six of them real quick, so write them down if you want to look at them later. But one is like the direct style. The Apostle Peter was like this. Direct style people are sort of like in your face. They're, they're very to the point because they're confident and they're very assertive. They are decision driven. You can see him in action in Acts chapter 2 when, when Peter stood there on the day of Pentecost in front of a crowd of thousands of people and boldly proclaimed the gospel and called them to decision. That's a direct style of evangelism. You have number two, uh, an intellectual style. Paul was a lot like this. Acts chapter 17, all through the book of Acts, in fact, you can see Paul enter into discussion, debate, using uh, you know, intellect and logic, you know, rationale, uh, asking questions, providing clarity. It's, it's, you know, it's for some, but it's not for others. People that are really interested in the field of apologetics find themselves more... Uh, in line with the intellectual style of evangelism. Number three is the testimonial style. This might be you. Testimonial style evangelism is simply telling other people what Jesus did for you. It doesn't even require knowledge of a bunch of Scripture, which I always encourage you to, to memorize as much Scripture as you can. 
But the testimonial style is simply telling your story, what Jesus did for you and what, he belie- what you believe he can do for somebody else. In John chapter 9, the blind man who got healed by Jesus, he didn't have much information to offer. When the religious crowd pulled him in and began to interrogate him about what happened, how did this happen, who did this, you know what his response was? Listen, I don't know. All I know was I was blind, now I can see. If you want an explanation, go ask the man who did it. His name's Jesus. That's all I got. Maybe that's your story. I was a drunk. I was a drug addict. I was this. I was that. God radically saved me. Jesus came into my life, changed everything about me. I don't know how he did it. I don't know why he did it. Ask him. All right? Testimonial style. Then you have like Matthew you remember he was the tax collector that Jesus came by his booth and he said, uh, you know, Matthew, come follow me. He dropped everything and began to follow Jesus that day. Matthew is an example of what's called the interpersonal or relational style evangelism. Matthew liked to interact with people. He liked to share Christ with his friends. He'd build a relationship and then he'd introduce them to Jesus. You can see an example of that in Luke chapter 5. Matthew began to follow Jesus. The first thing he did was throw a party. Invite all of his tax collector buddies over. Hey, I, you know, I don't know much about this guy, but he is something else. So come over to my house on Saturday night and you can talk to him. You know, that's just like inviting people to church or inviting people to a life group Bible study. Inviting people over to your house for a cookout when you know that people from the church are going to be there. And, and through those relationships, influence them toward a relationship with Christ. Uh, number five is the invitational style. Where, where you're simply just asking people to come and see. Like the Samaritan woman at the well in, in John chapter 4. She met Jesus. They had this long conversation about uh, this water, this living water that he was explaining to her uh, represented himself. And he would become in a person a spring that would well up into eternal life. When she finally understood what he was talking about, man, she was so overjoyed that she went back to town And she invited everybody, hey, come see, come talk to this man who who told me everything about myself that he would have no other way of knowing. Just, I know you don't believe it, but just come. Just come talk to him, invitational style. And then number six, Acts chapter 9, where we meet a, a lady by the name of Tabitha, who is an example of what's called the serving style approach to evangelism. Some people call it servant evangelism. You like to work behind the scenes. You like to do good things or acts of kindness for other people. You're not worried about getting recognition, but you feel that that is the best way that you can have an impact and show people the love of God simply by doing things and serving them in some capacity. Again, we could probably add to the list Maybe you go down that list and you think, well, you know, I could be this or I could be that, maybe a mixture of some of them. Whatever the case might be, it all comes back to this. We have the responsibility. Whether you take the direct approach or the the behind-the-scenes servant approach, it takes all of us. We work together to carry out this, what is called the Great Commission. That's what Mark chapter 16 verse 15 is the great commission the sending out of God's people to tell the world the good news about Jesus and so now we find ourselves in Acts chapter 8 with this interaction between Philip and this Ethiopian official and I think what we find in this story are some really good principles some guidelines or tips if you will for when it comes time to tell other people about Jesus. So let's read it, and then I'll give you those here in just a moment. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. That's a, an official, a government official, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake. Now in other translations, it would say of Candace. It's referring to the queen of Ethiopia. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, told Philip, 
Go to that chariot and stay near it. So Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who, who's the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Now, there's a lot we can unpack from that story. One of the primary benefits, I think, that we gain from Luke having told us the story, it shows us how to avoid being obnoxious or apathetic. It shows us how to be, uh, avoid being ineffective when it comes to evangelism. And Now, let me just speak a moment about Philip himself, just so, again, we're not misunderstanding who he was. We don't assume things about him that aren't true. Philip was not a church leader. Philip was not one of the apostles. Philip was not even one of the original, uh, you know, selected among the believers to hold any particular office within the church. Philip was your average guy who simply... The apostles acknowledged him. They, they saw in him a spark. And they said, man, he's full of the Holy Spirit. Here's a guy he just wants to help. He wants to do something to help us get this message out to the masses. And so if you go back a few chapters in the book of Acts, you see that they made Philip a deacon. And now I don't know what your experience is or knowledge is when it comes to deacons. But this is not your, what you might be familiar with, your traditional Baptist church deacon. You know, who sits on a board and thinks they run the church. Not that kind of deacon. <laughs> That's not a biblical deacon. In fact, a biblical deacon, the word means, it's, it's the Greek word diakonos. It means a servant. One who is a wait, literally translated, one who is a waiter of tables. A host. Someone who comes alongside the church leaders to help serve the needs and the people of the church. That's Philip, your average guy who just simply says, I am willing to help. If there's anything I can do, just let me know and I'll do it. He represents the kind of believer we all should strive to be. Just willing to be a part and do what we can. And so when he does, here are a few tips from his example about telling other people about Jesus. Remember these. Number one, be alert. Be alert. If we were to back up and read this in context, whether we just go back to chapter 7 or all the way back to Acts chapter 1, what we quickly discover is that this was an exciting time in early church history. We are witnessing here the very birth of the New Testament church. But just as it was exciting, it was very tense. You have Jesus who ascended into heaven after his crucifixion and resurrection. Peter preaches the gospel at Pentecost. The power of the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers. People are getting saved. They're coming to the church by the thousands. But then persecution breaks out. The Roman government those who still adhere to Judaism, they began to persecute this new thing called the church. These Christians or little Christs. And because of this persecution, they begin to scatter. People are leaving Jerusalem and going to anywhere they can to find safety and, and refuge. You see, even that, was a fulfillment of what Jesus said just before he went to heaven. He said, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem 
in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. If it wasn't for the scattering of persecution, the gospel may have never reached the other ends of the world. So even God was sovereign in the suffering, right? But because of this scattering, because of the persecution, Philip found himself in Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And there he began to proclaim the gospel. People were responding to it in the droves. Miracles were taking place. People were coming and wanting to be a part of of the church. It was great. It was everything that you could want in a startup ministry. Like they, if they were going to build a church, they couldn't build it fast enough. They couldn't build it big enough. People were coming and responding that, that quickly. And then God says, hey, Philip, I need you to leave. I need you to pick up from here and, and go somewhere else. I need you to go out on this desert road. There's something for you to do out there. Yeah, it's in the middle of nowhere, but just go. I mean, it's a strange command, and certainly we wouldn't blame Philip for having wondered why. Or even being bold enough to ask, God, why would, why would we do that? Why would we leave here when everything that's happening right here is so great? I mean, this is an awesome place to begin a ministry. So many people are, being, uh, respond, are responding. Why would we go to some place out in the middle of the desert where we don't even know if there's anybody out there? But we didn't read about Philip saying that, did we? He didn't resist. He didn't challenge God in any way. He didn't question. He didn't argue. He just went. When God spoke, he was alert. In other words, he was sensitive enough to recognize God's instruction. And then he just obeyed. The question is, are we alert? Are we sensitive to what God is saying to us, how he's leading. If we're going to tell other people about Jesus, we're going to share our story, we probably shouldn't wait until one of our co-workers or our friends or you know, some stranger runs up to us and, and falls at our feet and just says, you know, please tell me about Jesus. i got to get saved, whatever that means. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The likely scenario is that God will begin to work in the life and heart of someone without our knowledge. Again, a friend, a coworker, a family member, someone we go to school with. God will begin to deal with them in a very particular way. And then when the time is right, their path will cross with our path, and God will say, hey, run up beside that chariot. Just hang out beside them for a little bit, and when it's right, I will prompt you with what to say, how to say it. Hey, go make friends with them. Go sit with them at lunch. Start up a conversation with them in the break room today. See, that's how it, that's how it works. The question is, are we going to be alert enough to recognize when God speaks that way? Number two goes right in hand with this. Be available. Being alert and being available, they're like twins. They are very similar, and you rarely ever see them apart. Think about it. What good is it? To be alert, to be aware and sensitive to what God is doing if you're not going to join Him. If you're not going to be available to participate. On the flip side of that, what good would it do to be available, to want to participate in what God's doing, but you have no idea what He's doing? You're not sensitive enough to His leadership in your life to recognize it. You need both of these, to be alert and to be available. Again, you go back to Philip's example. He could have questioned God's logic. Why leave this large city where all of these people are responding to the gospel and go out to a desert road? He could have said, God, I'm happy where I'm at. I like it right here. Things are going really well for me. I'm busy and I'm having success. It goes back, I think, to one, Philip being of the deacon mindset. He recognized, I'm I'm the servant here. I'm not the one who calls the shots. He recognized his role 
in God's kingdom building enterprise. I am simply a laborer. And if God says go here or go there, then here or there is where I'm going. And that's what I'm going to do. I just want to be available. Would that describe you? Would you describe yourself as, as a person who, like Philip, is available? I'm not saying that God is going to call you to pack up everything tomorrow and move to some strange place where you don't know anybody. He might. I mean, the question is, if he did, one, would you do it? Or two, would you even know he asked? Are you alert enough? Would you even know it if he was leading you in that direction? And if so, would you go? Be alert. Be available. Number three, telling others about Jesus often requires us to be proactive. You know, we don't want to be obnoxious. We don't want to go kicking in doors that aren't open. We don't also want to be passive or apathetic. And just think again, well, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will have a better opportunity. There, there comes a time when we have to be willing to speak up. Silence doesn't break down barriers. Silence doesn't break the ice. There comes a time when we all have to use our voice, whether it's to ask questions or to answer questions, to provide clarity, to give some, some, some sort of explanation. But when the opportunity presents itself, we will eventually have to speak. Philip, he ran up beside that chariot. It doesn't tell us how long uh, he was there. But he waited for an opportune time. He waited for that moment where he sensed God's spirit saying, okay, say something. Ask something. And so he then said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? He wasn't trying to, be, to, to insult the guy. He was simply being inquisitive. He, he understood that sometimes people don't know what they don't know. So he just asked. Do you understand what you're reading? That might not happen like that for you. You may not come across uh, someone in the break room at work reading their Bible with a puzzled look on their face. And you know, that person, I don't know if they've ever gone to church. That, it might not happen that way. But what if they're watching a YouTube video and you can hear that it has something to do with you know, the Bible, with world events, or with religion, or so, you know? Or they're having a conversation with another coworker, and you just overhear them talking about some things that are going on in their life, or they're having a hard time, or they just got some questions about, you know, like, I don't understand. Like, why is all these things happening to me? It could be anything, any situation, any conversation can become a gospel conversation if we'll just be alert, if we'll be available, if we'll be a little bit proactive. And maybe run up alongside them and just ask a very simple question. With that in mind, be tactful. Not rude. Not disrespectful. Not being someone who, who insults someone else or, or inconsiderate. Be tactful. Um, I read about this pastor who explained through his own experience what tactfulness looks like. And he said that he overheard this man walk up to a lady and ask her, like, the strangest question. The guy walks up to this lady and he says, hey, how's your kidneys? <laughs> He's like, what? what kind of question is that? Like, who walks up to somebody and says, how's your kidneys today? <laughs> Especially to a lady, right? It was so weird and confusing until the lady responded, Oh, they're great. Thanks for asking, Doc. That's a joke, guys. Okay, maybe you're saying it's not a funny joke. But you get the point. Like, it wouldn't make any sense if anyone else asked that question but a doctor who had a relationship with a patient and simply wanted to follow up on something he knew was going on in her life. You see, that's the way evangelism is. See, the doctor earns the right to ask those sort of personal questions. And spiritual questions are at times some of the most personal questions you could possibly ask. 
So don't be surprised if you get met with frustration, anger, aggression, or outright rejection if you have not put in the time, the effort, to earn the right to ask the question. You need that relationship. Don't go crossing bridges that you haven't been invited to cross. Don't try to kick through and go through doors that haven't been opened for you. Build that relationship. Earn the right. Put in the work. Show genuine interest. And when the time is right, the person will allow you to ask the pointed questions. That's what we see happen right here with Philip. He came alongside this chariot. It took some time, but under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the time was right for him to just simply say, Hey, is there anything I could do? Could I help you? Do you understand what you're reading? And in that moment, this government official says, Yeah, why don't you come up in here and let's talk about this a little bit. When the time is right, after you've been tactful, you've been patient, you'll ask the question and that person will say, yeah, climb up in my chariot here and let's, uh, let's talk about this a little bit. Hey, here, here's, here's my number. Give me a call after work because I got some questions. When that happens, when you're given that opportunity, here's, here's the last tip. Be precise. Be precise. When it comes to telling other people about Jesus and what he's done for you, what you believe he can do for them, being specific and staying on topic will make all the difference. Don't blow it by getting distracted and getting drug off topic and talking about everything else in the world except Jesus. That's what you're there to do. Philip didn't talk about politics. He didn't talk about social issues. He didn't talk about world religion. He didn't talk about the theological differences between uh, this denomination and that denomination. Listen, all of those conversations, they can be had, but not before a person decides what they will believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. Not until that person decides how he or she is going to respond to his invitation to salvation. Why? Because those other conversations don't matter if they're lost. There's a lot more we could say about this, but stay on topic. Be precise. Realize that God is at work around us all the time. Everywhere we go, He is working in the lives of people. Sometimes, in some ways, and in some people's lives, it is much more obvious than others. Just know that he's working. And that wherever God is working, he wants you to be involved in what he's doing. He wants you to be aware of what he's doing. He wants you to be available, to be a part of it. And when he gives you the, the, the opportunity to be a part, to have some, some hands-on practice and experience with what he's doing... Don't blow it. Be careful. Be sensitive. Be considerate. But also stick to the script, so to speak. Be specific. Say what it is that God has laid on your heart. Again, God just wants us to be involved in His kingdom building effort. And no matter your style, no matter your approach... No matter your, your personality, there is a place for you. There's a role for you to play. But if we'll remember these tips, when it comes that, to that moment, when we have the opportunity to share Christ with someone else, we'll be much more effective. We'll be much more courageous. We'll be much more contagious. So let's thank God for that. We're going to go um, out here in the main connector here in just a moment and celebrate some of those who have decided to take their next step today. Uh, we had some kids this week who responded to the gospel. We're always excited about that. Um, we also have an adult who's going to take his next step today. We're excited to, to witness that as well. So we invite everybody, if you will, 
you know, as you're leaving today, just sort of hang out in the main connector there and, and witness their, their public profession of faith. If you have never taken your next step of baptism, uh, I mean, you can today. You have to ride home wet, but that'd be okay. It's hot outside. Maybe it'll feel good. But if you don't want to do that, then it might be a good idea to send us a message and say, you know, I've given my life to Christ, but I've never taken that next step. I've never made a public profession of Christ, and I've never identified publicly with his death, burial, and resurrection in that way, and I need to do so. You might be wondering, well, why? Why would I do so? Well, because Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's a command. Uh, for you to follow, and I'd challenge you to do that. So we're excited about this, and we'd love for you to hang around and, and witness that. So let's pray, and then next week we're going to start a brand new series, and hope you'll uh, be excited to come and join us as we study through uh, the book of James. God, we love you. We thank you so much for what you're doing in our life, in our church. We thank you for all those kids that you sent our way, that you trusted us with them this week to share the gospel with them, and, and how we saw several of them give their life to Christ, and and decide, Lord, that, that they, too, needed to be forgiven of their sin. And that their only hope was you. God, we're so thankful that we could play a part in that this week. So, Lord, as we go out to celebrate this, will you be glorified? Would you be magnified today? And, and perhaps even prompt someone else to take their next step and to make their, public, uh, their faith public today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you next week.